So good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for, for being here. And um, <clears throat> there are handouts of the presentation on the back if you don't have it. Um, so my name is Francesco Boin, and uh, I'm the director of the Scleroderma Center at the University of California, San Francisco. I just started there a few months ago. Prior to that, for 15 years, I was at Johns Hopkins in, in Baltimore. So I went from one coast to the other, <laughs> venturing new territories. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it's an exciting kind of new, new opportunity, new uh, possibility to build something that is focused on scleroderma on the West Coast. Um, so I would like to thank the the thank the Scleroderma Foundation for inviting me and to allow me to present to you today. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Uh, the topic uh, is the Scleroderma hands and their care. And I wanted to, for a long time, to put together a talk on the, just the hands. Uh, there are many reasons. Well, first is that the hands have been very important since the very beginning. Uh, with the hands, we shape things, we, we generate things. And uh, so, definitely has been the first touch of the world. The hands are important because, you know, they can tell the story of a person. Uh, you, when the patient comes in to see me in clinic, the first part of the exam is always the hands. So you can learn a lot of things, but also the st what, the, what the patient or person has been through. Um, and the hands are important because they, they help us to communicate. It's something that we use to, to relate. I'm, I'm Italian and I wave hands a lot, so I know what that means. Uh, but, and also, you know, the, they are the heart and the matter of what, what we do and what we are. So they can do a lot of things. So I think hands are very important. But why are they important in scleroderma? Well, the f hands can be the place where we have the first hints of the disease. You know, oftentimes that's where, with careful attention, you can identify red flags, something that is wrong. Um, hands can tell us how you're doing. We can sort of get the sense of how active the disease is, how much is progressing, just by looking at the hands. They can be source of, uh, you know, they, they are exposed to a lot of threats because you use them all the time. So they can get inf develop infections, trauma. They can be source of pain, and they can change your quality of life remarkably. So it's not a minor detail in the overall picture of scleroderma, and because of the the consequences of being affected, they can be disfiguring and also for the emotional well-being of the patients are very, very important. So that's why I, I, I wanted to just focus on the hands. Uh, and we can learn a lot of things about it. Uh, there are many, so the, the, the hands in scleroderma reflect the complexity of the disease. Uh, and we can find features in, in the way the hands are affected that are related to the scarring process in scleroderma, to the vascular disease in scleroderma, you know, the, 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 the blood vessel damage. And there are manifestations that maybe reflect both. Um, and so to begin, the first part of the talk, we will look at the scarring, the excessive amount of scarring, the fibrosis that can affect the hands, in the f causing tightness and pain, dryness of the skin, very common problem, uh, fissuring, cracking, um, color changes, and most importantly, the, the flexion contracture, you know, the, the curling of the fingers, very, very important aspect that, that a lot of patient experience. Early on, the very, very, very early stages of the disease, the hands can be affected just with some puffiness. And some of you may have experienced early on, just when, even before they, they realize that you, ha you have scleroderma, uh, a sense of fullness and puffy fingers. And people didn't know is that carpal tunnel? Is, but that's the, kind of the early stage. So since the very beginning, this can be just the very first sign of the disease unfolding. And as the discarding get more, more established, we, and you heard this term before, uh, the characteristic kind of involvement of the hands is what we call sclerodactyly, which basically what it means is really the, oops, sorry, uh, the tightening and the, and the fibrosis that affect the digits up to the, to the knuckles. That's called sclerodactyly. 
with the dryness, with the dry skin, you know, the, it's not uncommon to see roughness and have a little kind of cuts and fissuring that, that are not trivial because they can become the source of infection, can become the origin of something much more involved. And um, even the digital pits, you know, this can be consequences of, of the, the active rhinos or previous ulcers, but they can stay there forever and never go away. And so this kind of rough, scaly skin on the fingertip. Again, the, the overall kind of burden of having this skin that doesn't heal completely and, 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 and where the blood flow is not optimal can, can manifest in this way. So I think thinking of how do we take care of the hands, of our hands, and the first big area is fighting dryness. As a rule, any patient with scleroderma should be very meticulous in moisturizing the skin everywhere, but particularly on the hand, particularly when you know, the, 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 the excessive of dryness becomes prominent. And so how, what, what do I recommend? What do we recommend to be used? Well, first of all, there are very good moisturizing cream available commercially. And what I recommend is creams that are neutral, that don't have fragrance in it, uh, the one I like is the Neutrogena hand cream. Eucerin has a, is a good line of product. Uh, Vanny cream also. These are just three of some of the one that, that can be easily found on, on, on the, on the, uh, in the pharmacy. But they're good because they, they, they don't introduce other uh, chemicals that can, can damage the skin or irritate the skin. And they are rich enough to, to provide that moisturizing uh, effect that, that is needed. Uh, keep in mind that most of them, after you wash your hands, they go away. So you have to be generous on, on, on using them repeatedly. But these are the ones that I think is an examples of the one that can be very helpful. If the skin is drier, you start to have more scaly skin. There are some more potent hand cream. So these are two. Um, so I'm lactic and caramel. So basically they have other compound inside. Uh, lactic acid and urea who can exfoliate the skin a little more. So when there is that excessive roughness, I would not use them always all the time, but they can be helpful to sort of eliminate some extra scaly skin. And then if you get some cracking or fissuring, uh, I cannot find better uh, preparation than basilin based preparation ointment, um, petroleum jelly or so, just of, of course temporarily, but they, they really help, first of all, to ease out the pain associated with cuts and, and, and cracking, and also they, they accelerate healing. And some people find benefit by using liquid Band-Aid. It's kind of uh, coating the area and, and sort of uh, protecting it. it can be very helpful. Now, the key thing though is that if there is an infection, you should not put the, the liquid Band-Aid on top of it, because basically then you're stacking the infection underneath and it's harder to fight. So you have to be attentive not to do that. But other than, than, than those situations, it can be helpful uh, in dealing with, with the excessive dryness and the consequences on the hand. The second major point is keep the hand clean. You know, and, and, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Uh, without becoming obsessed, okay, nobody need to be OCD with that, but it's important, it's important to keep it in mind because, you know, we live in an environment. Now, with that I mean to use good preparation and to avoid strong detergent. So dish soaps, laundry stuff, and if, of course, if in your normal life you may have to use them, but you wear gloves. Don't get your skin exposed to strong detergent because they really wipe out whatever is left of the natural ointment of the skin and they make it even more dry. So per, keep that in mind. I know it's a little couple plates or something, but even so, get your gloves. There are different type of gloves you can use, but uh, gloves can, you, can, you can adopt, but keep this in mind. And the second thing is minimize use of alcohol-based preparation. So hand sanitizer, in, in, it can be helpful in some special occasion, you're flying on an airplane or, but they cannot be the daily thing you use because the alcohol get the moist out of the skin. And, and so be careful, not don't overuse them. Otherwise you would dry out the skin much faster and, 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 and deeply. What I recommend is using simple soap and water twice a day, three times a day, neutral soap. Uh, this is an example like um, uh, Cetaphil is, is a good 
example of, of something super neutral. They have some with antibacterial on it, which is fine. But there are many others. Again, this is not, I'm not endorsing any product. I'm just saying, give you an exact practical example of what you can find. But neutral soap and water apply, that, that's how you want to keep your hand clean. As a rule of thumb, whatever you would use on a beautiful small baby for, for his or her skin, that's what you need to use to your skin. Think of the scleroderma skin as a baby skin and, and use products that, that, that would be so gentle, like, like uh, this is the, the, uh, the son of, of Dr. Hamill who works with me at Scleroderma Center at UCSF. She said, oh, you can use that. <laughs> So third point, protect from trauma, okay? You have to play ahead of the game here. You cannot wait until you get the ulcers or the damage because then it's hard to heal. Remember, blood flow is not optimal in the scleroderma hands, and therefore healing is much more prolonged. So you have to play ahead of the game, prevent those. And there are many strategies, but you can find easily finger sleeves and gloves and stuff that can protect it. For example, these are available on the stores online for people who play football. They, 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 they like to put the, or, or export that there, are, there is impact. And so you can find them very, very easily. These are just like neoprene, like a soft preparation. These are the one we recommend in clinic. These are even, you have to have to some specialized store or even online. And they're really good because they, they have silicone inside. The lining inside is silicone. So it doesn't stick. If you have an ulcer or something, it doesn't stick. And they are super soft, and you can actually decide how you want to do it. You can take a tube and, and cut the proper, it can be good on hands and feet as well. But this to say, those are very simple things that will protect your hands if needed, and, and they can make a big difference. Final recommendation for hand care, keep your hand warm. Uh, some people have much more involved Raynaud's, but, but as a baseline, the blood flow is not good, so you should be ready to provide that, 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 that comfort warm to your hands all the time. Uh, and um, there are many ways to do it. You know, mittens, gloves, there are some of them have pockets to put hand warmers. There are chemical hand warmers. There are electric hand warmers, y you name it. And again, I don't want to get into details, but just, you know, there are some of them with the, the teal color for the scleroderma foundation, so you can be very supportive. At, take care of your hand, keep them warm. Color changes. So we discussed that sometimes uh, I have patients coming to me and say, oh, what can we do? They are, they are changing color, they are white. And so what I want to emphasize is that this type of color changes, even here, it, you know, it's a little wider here. So these are part of the healing process. So the skin gets damaged and then it starts to renew itself. And in renewing, it grows new skin with less pigment cells. And so they can have this appearance almost like vitiligo. It's not a sign of the disease, it's a sign of the renewal process. So there is not a target for therapy. There is, not, we, there is nothing we can do to treat that. Just take it as a good sign. And you know, you know that this can be present also in other part of your body, particularly if with darker texture, it's more apparent and visible. What I want to emphasize though, this is baby, once again, this is baby skin, sunscreen protection. It gets burned very easily. And so, don't damage your skin with sunburn. So if, if you have these color changes, and in general, as a rule of thumb, sunscreen protection at all time. There is also some, some evidence that damaged skin can trigger more damage and more inflammation. So just, just be careful, particularly if you have these kind of areas where you lost the pigment and, and be considerate. And so let's talk about flexion contracture, right? That's an important part of, of, of the scarring part of the hands in scleroderma. Very important because it, it determines loss of function. That's the first important part. Um, loss of function and atrophy of the skin. So basically, when you have this contracture, you lose the fat pad under the skin. So it's just a very thin layer of skin with the bony surfaces that are now exposed. Very easy to break. So for, for a normal skin, you know, a little bump is just a little bump. But for somebody with scleroderma and, and some contracture, this can become the source of an ulcer. It can become a threatening event uh, can get infected and oftentimes you know, can lead to more serious consequences such as infection that doesn't heal and, and need for amputation. So that's why it's a very delicate problem. So how do you develop, why, why, why do patients develop flexion contracture? So basically, 
it's due to scarring that, that start to encase the tendons that we have on the inner part of our hand, on the palmar surface of the hand. So the tendons are the, the, the structure that allow us to close, make a fist, to create opposition on the finger. Uh, and in the process of scarring of the skin, the pro it, this goes deeper, encase this tendon and start to pull them and, and the curling happen, right? And, and this is anatomically, the tendon goes underneath the, the joint and here you can imagine every finger then, then there is the curling that happens. Now, this can be a subtle problem so there are patients that the only thing you see is just the difficulty of stretching out the fingers. That's a very subtle kind of uh, change, but it can become much more involved where the contractures, you know, you start to have like hook-like fingers and in some cases it can become extreme to the point that you lose completely the ability to use your fingers. You lose the minimal function. That, 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 that's why it's so important to, to, to keep this in mind. So, the key point about flexion contracture are that they are reversible only early on. So even when the rest of the skin soften out, unfortunately the hand has always some leftover scarring. And if you develop over a long time contracture of, your hand, of the digits, it's unlikely that you're going to suddenly see them softening and straightening it out. So it's something that we need to counteract and start to fight early, early, early on. And stretching exercises and hand therapy, it's a, an important recommendation that I always give to my patient early on. Uh, we will see some example. But the goal is to prevent further progression and, and, and to preserve as much as you can the hand function. Um, just keep in mind that, that if already there are some contracture and on top of that there are ulcers and, 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 and um, infection, is going to invariably make the contracture worse. And there's no doubt about it. Part of it because the infection then can cause more scarring, but also even the fingertip ulceration that, that you're not going to use that finger much more, it's going to get stuck, freeze out, and then curl even more. So that's why, once again, the emphasis on preventing infection. Do everything you, can, you have to make sure you, know, you don't develop complication and infection. Um, and and that's, that's the, the point, protector knuckles, because these are the most vulnerable part of the hands when you have a flexure contracture. Again, the notion that a simple minor trauma, it's enough here to trigger an ulcers and then long-lasting consequences such as this, okay? Now, what can we do? Well, first of all, occupational therapy can be very helpful. They can be a resource at your place, near, near where you live, to learn exercises. But the bottom line is, Deep massages of the hand, I found that they can be helpful. They sort of ease out the tightening along the tendon that, that caused the contracture. And then I think the number one recommendation, daily exercises that you can do on your own. Is, you know, like this nice young woman is doing, putting down the table and pushing down, you know, praying a lot, I, all these things. You know, that it's very, very effective, very important. The goal is to do stretching, range of motion, so try to maintain the motion and the opposition of the finger and some strength, strengthening because the other point is that the fingers get stuck and you lose then the strength also to use the fingers. So this is an example. Uh, actually, this is a, you have it on the handout. This is a, an article you can find online of, of different exercises to do stretching on the hands. You know? and, and this gentleman here is giving a series of, of, of uh, examples how to do it. But it takes a few minutes and you can do it once or twice a day on your own. And it, it's, helps a lot if, if it becomes part of your routine. Or, or like for the strengthening, anything rubber and, and, and with some resistance can help, you know, the range of motion and the strengthening of the fingers between the fingers, opening the fingers, closing, making the ring. So these are all things that you can just do on your own. And, and, and in fact, you know, I, I, I think the Scleroderma Foundation next year should make stress ball for the conference because I think those are very helpful. Again, I, I give out, I don't have the Scleroderma Foundation balls, but uh, I have other stress balls, and, and those can be a good, uh, good, simple tool to have when you watch TV or everything else and you just kind of keep mobilizing and stretching your, your, your digits. Very, very, I think is the most important recommendation. There are some tools to prevent progression. So the ring splints or resting splints. So hypothetically, they are good in a sense. Those are, you, these are actually, they make it silver, so like also nice. And, 
and hypothetically, they, they sort of prevent the progression, but they're more theoretically helpful than practically because the, the contraction don't hap happen overnight. It's not that you sort of uh, have a problem one time and then that's it. It takes a long time. And so they become uncomfortable over, over a certain period of time. And I never found that ultimately they really make a huge difference. They can be helpful if you have an infection and you want to heal and so you protect from. Sometimes when you have an infection on the knuckle, you don't want to move it too much. But other than that, I think the daily exercises remain the most important recommendation to really counteract this curling manifestation that, that can, the scarring can bring to the hands. Preserving function. So whatever cannot be achieved by yourself with, with, the, with the stretching and everything, just become creative. Okay, there is a lot of things you can come up with. Uh, this is where occupational therapy can be very helpful. They have a lot of uh, tools and strategies and, and tricks to, uh, to make the use of the hand more functional. But I can guarantee you that, that, that I have seen over the years patients coming up with solutions that I never thought about. So uh, to, to do what they, people want to do. And, and these, are, these are just examples to increase the size of the, the way you handle tools or, or based on the degree of contracture to find out ways to, to open your doors and so forth. So keep, keep in mind that what cannot be reversed Still, there is a lot of things that can be done, and it can change the life of a person. There's no doubt about it. Now, there are some surgical options. So I discuss this with my patients. Um, in some cases, only for this joint, the, 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 the proximal interphalangeal joint, the PIP, is not for this knuckle here. When the flexor are here, there is a procedure called arthrodesis, which is called joint, is basically joint fusion, that can be done particularly when there is a maximum level degree of contracture to, to sort of open up the hand a little bit. They maintain it still on a semi-flex, but you can imagine going from a situation where you cannot pinch anything, where you can have some opposition. It's already a major kind of uh, improvement. Now, the trick is that the hands of scleroderma patients are, are not always healing properly. So that, that's a problem that you have to wait how many chances are there that the surgical cut or the inside won't heal right. And, 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 and sort of have a very experienced hand surgeon who can help you to make that determination. So it's not a, this is not a kind of, for everybody, it's not a routine procedure. But it can be done, and I've seen some cases where it was really remarkable, the fact that somebody who was not able to use the hands anymore, now at least they can, you know, have some function. So it's an option to be seriously considered, possibly with somebody who knows what they are doing. Because again, you don't want to do surgery not knowing what the, what's the background, what, what's, what's behind, you know, in terms of the blood vessel flow, in terms of the other, the scarring and everything else, okay? Good. So that, that covers the, the fibrosis, the scarring, and all that. And I hope that has been clear. So Let's move to the other side of, 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 of the hands manifestations in scleroderma, which is the vascular disease. And obviously, we're going to touch upon Raynaud's, even if this is not, there will be a dedicated session on Raynaud's, so I won't be too long there. And other few uh, changes that are more related to the vascular disease of, of scleroderma. So Raynaud's, most of you know what it is. Uh, it's a kind of an episodic uh, vasospasm ischemic event in response to cold or, or emotional distress that is associated with the typical color changes, you know, the, the finger turning pale and white with a very kind of demarcated line, can be symmetrical or asymmetrical, uh, or even purple, dark purple, again, and in general this is reversible. Common up to 95% of scleroderma patients. Now, I won't get into treatment I want, I want, that's another topic, but I wanted to share what can you do from the hand standpoint to help with Raynaud's. And I put a list of what I call the avoids. So the first obvious kind of avoid is avoid cold temperature and with a couple caveats. First of all, it's not just the hands that need to be kept warm, it's the whole body that need to be kept warm. You know, core temperature is very important because otherwise the brain still perceives cold and it's going to trigger Raynaud's. 
Second, shift in temperature. So it's not just the outside temperature that matters. But I have patients from Florida, and when it's air conditioning season, it's, it's a nightmare because you, you go with a delta of temperature that is huge, and, and, and that change of environment can definitely trigger. So keep that in mind. Or work environment, a little bit of you know, cold breeze that gets to your, it's not good because at the end you're gonna go into that mode where you tend to have more active raiment. So very important. Nervous tension, avoid nervous tension and anxiety. There is no doubt that that can increase the sensitivity of the blood vessel to, to the temperature and trigger rain. So learn how to relax. Adopt strategy, lifestyle strategies to ease out the burden of life and, and, and that will have beneficial effect. Inactivity, so don't become a couch potato. The, 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 the physical activity helps pushing just simple walking. You don't have to do crazy stuff, but just simple walking can, can help blood flow and in general, the circulation. So there is no doubt that inactivity make it worse. And then aggravating factors, uh, smoking, first-hand and second-hand smoking, there is no doubt that this sort of um, enhance and, and, and exacerbate rain nodes. Uh, anything vibratory, you know, the, fine, the, the, the finest the vibration, the more likely this can trigger um, vasospasm the inactive rainers. And then some drugs, we are, I'm going to go through the list of, of those who can normally get over the counter or that your, your doctor don't even know can be responsible for making Raynaud's worse. So for example, migraine remedies, they, are, they all function by shutting down blood vessels. So of course, with somebody with Raynaud's, they can trigger it. Cold, uh, like decongestants, like Sudafed, and they all function by closing up the blood vessels in the affected areas, but the, the, pay, the price you pay is that also in the periphery they can yield Raynaud's. Uh, beta blockers and clonidine are blood pressure medication and commonly used. Those are not good for Raynaud's. They will enhance Raynaud's, actually. So there are many others blood pressure medications, so the, the primary cares or need to be wise in the way they choose them. Caffeine can do that. Drugs for ADHD like Ritalin or um, weight reducing drugs so that has amphetamine on it, uh, these are, are certainly uh, associated with worse, worsening of, of renal symptoms. Some, some chemo drugs um, uh, are known to exacerbate renals. And then I put cocaine. I'm not assuming that this is over the counter and use, use it all the time, but, <laughs> but it, it can, it's, it's, a, it's a very potent kind of uh, visospastic drug, so don't do it. Um, is there anything else you can do uh, besides what the doctor prescribed? Well, you know, I mentioned biofeedback. Biofeedback goes to the point of relaxation technique. In fact, yoga is here because it's been shown, I think it's mostly because of the fact that you are able to, to, to ease out the, the anxiety, tension, and, and so it, it definitely is beneficial. I have some patients that even went to acupuncture and over time has been yielding good results uh, of, of decreasing the symptoms. It didn't resolve it, but can help. Uh, same thing for laser therapy. I don't have ex personal experience, but there's been data reported in the, in the journals that laser can help. And then you're gonna read on, not on scientific journal, but on the news and constantly complementary medicine, some, some, some natural products who can be good. And the reality, my experience is that if they help and fine, but I, if there is serious problem with vascular circulation in the hand, those are not gonna get you, uh, keep you out of trouble. So can they be a good supplement? Sure, I don't think that's where the money is or where you're gonna have um, sizable effects in terms of controlling your renals. But just to keep in mind what you can do on your side. Now, one final point on the, on the vascular, on the renal side. So, Raynaud's, as we discussed, is a reversible vasospasm. What that means is that, so this is an aureole. On the, I'm, I'm here on the upper panel of, of, of the slide. So this is an aureole. This is a venal, a venal venous, and um, this is the capillary web, right? So the, the, the blood goes from one side to the other and, and, and provide flow through the capillaries up on the skin surface. That's how you have a nice pink blushing skin. When there is a Raynaud attack, Basically, the, the, the sphincter, so these are little valves that goes to the capillary, shut down. And so the blood is kept away from the capillaries, away from the surface, into the shunts that are between the artery and the vein. And that's how the skin becomes pale. Now, by definition, Raynaud's is reversible. And with, with 
variable amount of time, but you should cycle from this stage to this stage and back to a situation where you have proper, proper blood flow. Why am I saying this? Is because if you have signs of injury, which is a color of the fingers or an affected finger that doesn't change, doesn't turn back to normal, or unfolding of an ulcer, or even manifestation of some gangrene, this is not normal or is not a typical normal uncomplicated brain noise. It always suggests there is something more going on, just to keep in mind. And so you don't have to, you don't wanna wait until things get worse. Like for example, this is a patient that has complete blockage of some of the major arteries. So we said, normally scleroderma is a small vessel disease, but in some cases, it starts to affect also larger arteries that can get completely narrowed down, like in this case. And if, you know, as a, as a general most important rule, if there is permanent discoloration and an increasing pain, it doesn't get any better, it gets worse and is prolonged, these are signs that there is a, an established critical ischemia, so lack of blood flow to the digit. And, and this is one of those cases you are entitled, you have to call the doctor right away or go to the emergency room because you, you want to avoid you know, worse outcome that sometimes happen and we need to prevent those, okay? So I just put it out there just to say, one thing is to talk about keeping your hand cold and relax, and so keep your hand warm and relax, but if you have something more than that, is, it's important to address it right away, don't, don't wait. Now, final couple, uh, items on the vascular side of the hands. One is the capillary abnormalities. I'm sure you heard about this or, or your doctor look carefully, but sometimes they are visible even with, with your own eye at the, base, at the base of the nail fold. They can be present as little hemorrhages, like splinter hemorrhages, little red dots, or even like, like a halo of red. We do look at them. They are helpful early on to make a diagnosis of scleroderma. You know, we can use an ophthalmoscope or even a dermatoscope if we look carefully. They give us very good sense that there is an underlying vascular disease. And in, there's been also some interest in see whether they can help us monitoring the disease afterwards, right? So these are normal capillaries, early changes, and then later on they've shown that you can tell how long the renos was there or how long the damage of the blood vessel happened. So it's something to keep in mind. In, as a vascular manifestation on the hands. And then the other obvious uh, kind of finding that oftentimes we see in clinic or you have experienced is the presence of these red dots, what we call the telangiectasias, right? These are uh, dilatation of the venules. You know, remember the scheme I showed before, after the capillaries, the venules can get dilated and all bundled up and create these kind of little dot, red dots. It can be just one and that's a, it can be a hint or in some patients they can become more, more numerous on the hands or in other parts of their body. Typically the face, even the trunk can be, can be affected. And uh, the point here is they are just a sign of the disease and over time when they get established they tend to become more numerous and, and, and a little bigger. Uh, laser can be done. In some cases uh, it's effective but they, invariably they flare, they come back. It's, it's the nature of the, of the process. So you can remove them, but then they will come back. And there are some insurance issues, whether the procedure is considered medically necessary versus cosmetic, so coverage is not always provided. But it's some, there is something that can be done, particularly if they are uh, you know, on, on the face. Uh, in some cases, there are some benefit that can last for a year or two, even if then you have to repeat the procedure. Okay. Um, so that's for the vascular part. And um, let's focus on two other kind of interesting and important um, findings on, on, on the hands of the scleroderma patient. So the, the acroosteolysis, basically the shortening of the fingers, which is present in 10, 15% of patients. And then the other is more common, the calcinosis, the calcium deposit. So calcinosis, calcium deposit, it's uh, something that uh, may be very minimal, uh, can be just a little small area where calcium accumulate. You may not even see it. It may just be feel felt like a hardening under the fingertip or can be a little uh, more prominent like this and in some case mistaken for an infection. People say, oh, I have pus. And, but the reality is that the calcium can be liquid, can be chalk-like material or can be hard as a rock. 
but that's why when it's in the liquid form, particularly early on, people think, oh, this is an infection, and they start to take antibiotics that they don't need to. Uh, a simple x-ray just tells you what it is, because that's how that thumb looks like on x-rays. It's just a big accumulation of, of calcium. And in this case, it was just, just a thumb, but there are situations where calcium can be much more widespread. Now, in some cases, we call it tumoral calcinosis, meaning that it's in multiple places and can start to become a problem, not just a little area of, of involvement. Or like here, in this patient, there was a, you know, in, on the cervical spine, behind the neck, there was a lump due to this kind of calcium accumulation. Or in this other patient of mine, under the feet, you know, can be quite, quite uncomfortable. Um, we don't know exactly what caused the calcium, but it's felt that it's a combination of factors. Uh, local trauma and friction being one of the most important one. You know, usually it comes in areas where there is a repeated trauma or repeated friction, you know, the, the, the extensor surface of, of the elbows, the fingertips, or other areas where there are shear forces. Um, so that's important. The, 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 the blood supply deficit can favor that, and then probably there are some predisposition, the way they electrolyze the calcium, the phosphate, sort of play together, and, and in some individuals, they may be more prone to deposit into the tissues. So what are the consequences of calcinosis? Well, first is skin breakages. They can break up to the surface. And then well, sometimes that's good because they get extruded. But it can also open the door for infections to go in. So that's always to be kept in mind. They can cause inflammation in the surrounding tissue. It's like having a rock and you rub around it. Then you get inflammation. So that's also a possibility, causing pain, disability. And the other kind of manifestations, when they get a little deeper around the joints, for example, they can erode into the bone. Because of this inflammation, secrete chemicals that they can solve the, 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 the bone, minerals. And therefore, in some cases, they can become a problem. And then the, the clubbing and the, the shortening of the digit that I showed before can also be associated with calcinosis. So this is an example of, of what it means breaking through the skin. So, as you can see, there are different bumps here, which are all deposits of calcium. And at and, and some point, they made it to the surface. Like here, for example, you can see the white stuff coming out. This is not pus. This is just the calcium extruding from the skin. Obviously, this is where it's a little inflamed, so there is a little bit of redness around here. And obviously, there's always concern that that can be a place where some bacteria goes in, and then it becomes infected, and then you need to treat your antibiotic. This is another interesting example. So here, this patient got antibiotics like for weeks and weeks, and they felt that this was an abscess. And the reality is, this wasn't an abscess. This was the calcium, as you can see again, the white material, and then this was surrounding inflammation in the absence of an infection. But the calcium was triggering local inflammation, and, and you need to recognize this. And the, sometimes it's tricky, but you know, it's unlikely if there is no overt breakage that, that that's an infection. And in fact, when you take the x-rays here, you see that there is, again, the, the, the big bulk of calcium. And in this case, you see the point I was making that it can even damage the structure. Here is getting into the bone and, and, and taking over it is, is damaging the bone. And then she has another lesion down here, another, another accumulation. We're going to talk about that in a minute, about whether to remove it or not. That's a very important question, because it actually is the main question that, that we are asked. And, and this is another example where the calcium here, this is a wrist. And, and basically, there is a sheet of calcium all over. And basically, the patient lost the function of, of, of the wrist. And when you take the x-rays, you see it, all the calcium along the dorsum of the hand here. And in this case, because it was compressing some nerves, so she was losing the the nerve sensation, we have to try to, to clean it out. And that's what we got out, all this kind of debris coming out of the, of the, of the elbows. And this was the other patient I saw you, show you. You know, I, we, we, we actually presented as walking on rocks, because literally, they were hard as a rock. She stopped walking because of this. She couldn't walk. And so we had to do surgery here to remove them. Uh, and not just once. And the problem is, and I go in a minute into you know, your question, the problem is the surgery itself, it's a trauma. And surgery itself can cause new formation of calcium. 
but here we didn't have a choice. You know, she, uh, she was losing her ability to ambulate. This is another example of the, of the calcium getting into the bone and damaging, causing basically oste what we call osteolysis, kind of reabsorption of the bone. So it can be, it can be something that is good to look at the hands, assess them, and try to understand what we're dealing with. Elbow, so this is not your case, okay? This is an extreme case where this patient had this kind of, uh, she's a, another patient of mine, where the process was so active, and again, it's a minority, a small minority, that it destroyed the elbow, and we have to put a prosthetic elbow, like a, like a replace, elbow replacement, in order to maintain some function. Otherwise, she couldn't move the, the, the arm anymore. So it can be extreme, right? Now, what can we do? Medical therapy, it's, I'm comfortable to say that there is not an effective oral treatment or medical treatment that can reverse or melt the calcium deposit. Uh, there are a lot of reports in the medical literature, but there are like one case, two cases, what we call anecdotal, meaning it's more a story that the doctor tells to each other than a solid scientific evidence that there is a treatment, a compound or something that can melt away the, cal the calcium. And I put them here, all the drugs that has been tried, bisphosphonates are the drug that you use for osteoporosis, and then a few others. So there is some paper somewhere in the literature that say, oh, we got some, some results. We did even some trials, and there is some attempt to see whether this drug, sodium thiosulfate, works. But there, the, the results are not encouraging. We still are not there that we're able to reverse the process. Some people even try shock waves, like you do for kidney stones, to see whether they can break up the, the calcium and Again, not with, with uh, kind of reassuring or, or, or positive results. I think at the moment, while we are still looking to understand better what's causing this calcinosis and whether we can modify it, the most important recommendation is to avoid repeated trauma and uh, friction on affected areas because that's what we know really accelerate accumulation. And it's tough because the moment you start to accumulate calcium, you know, it becomes an area exposed and you get more. That's why surgery, you know, it's a, it's, it's a problem. Surgery, it's in itself a trauma that can, can sort of uh, cause more calcium in the future to accumulate. So when are we referring to surgery? Surgery, the indication, at least in my practice, is if there is persistent pain. So it's in a place where it's either because it's compressing a nerve or, but it's causing an intractable pain. Recurrent infection, so if there is a, a, a calcium deposit breaking the skin and there's an area where they constantly there is infection, maybe it's better to scoop it out so we can try to close up the, the ulcers or the breakage. Uh, if the ulcer, so again, even before the infection, if there's a non-healing ulcers uh, of, of, of bigger size, then maybe to help healing, taking away the calcium that is causing it, it may be a reasonable idea, or functional impairment. So, the patient I show you, you know, under the feet, that's functional impairment. I had a patient who developed like a, an apple-sized uh, calcium deposit on the buttocks. She liked to ride horses. And, 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 and by doing that, the friction, she has this big kind of calcium deposit, but she stopped being able to sit down. It was, it was impossible for her. So that, we had to do it because the lifestyle was not good. These are the situation where we sort of say, okay, let's do it. But the point is, is symptomatic relief. Surgery itself can stimulate more calcium, and so the recurrent is very common after exciting and cleaning out. So it has to be something to be kept in mind when you are evaluating whether surgery is indicated or not. Better to leave it alone and to avoid if it's not causing one of these kind of more involved complications, okay? We don't have a sense that, that uh, so there is some, some practitioner who said you should limit your dairy or the amount of calcium, but we don't believe that that's gonna make, the, the way we, our body works, if you are prone to accumulate calcium, you know, even with the, we, we, with the regular aliment, food you eat, you're gonna have that type of imbalance. So I don't have a sense that by taking daily calcium would in any way worsen your calcinosis. It's, it's all a combination also of local factors, and I, I, don't, I would not con in all conscience say stop eating calcium because that's gonna worsen your calcinosis. That's a good, a good question because you always recur in clinic. 
And then pseudo clubbing, meaning the drumstick appearance of, you know, of the digit with shortening of the distal part of the digit of the finger. Not everybody, but there, it's, it's something that we have been observing in some patients. And when you take an x-ray, that's, that's what you see. You see that, that the distal segment, you know, this is the different phalanxes, the different segment, the distal part is disappearing. And the result is that the digits are shortening. Uh, in this case, it's not associated with calcinosis. These are just remnants of the bone that was there. In, uh, the patient I showed before has also the calcium that is accelerating this process. Uh, we don't fully understand why this happened. And again, not in everybody. It's not a common uh, manifestation in everybody, but uh, probably, again, combination of poor flow and trauma may facilitate this. And in some cases, it can be really devastating. Again, I'm sh I didn't want to give you a sense that this is all this is a typical scenario. I want to give you some extreme to tell you that we are interested in understanding what's the nature of this process because it can be as severe as in, in this case that I'm showing you with what we say telescoping, you know, shortening of the digits. There's no therapy. There's nothing specific we can do also because it happens over a very, very, very long time. So it's not even possible to think, oh, we're going to do a trial to see whether we can stop it because it happens over five, ten years. Uh, you can really keep somebody on an investigative medication for that time to figure out whether you can slow down half centimeter of, 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 uh, of shortening. But I think the recommendation of avoiding repeating traumas uh, remain, is, is kind of important. Uh, with, together with achieving good control, keep your Reynolds under good control, keep your hands warm and avoid that. Uh, I think those are the main, the main recommendations. Okay, and to conclude, the last part of, of this presentation is ulcers. So let's focus on the most common problem, phone call that we receive. I have a doctor, I develop an ulcer. So what can we do for it? It's hurting and, and, and please help. So very important. And up to now, for all I show you, uh, I think you appreciate how important it is to, to take good control right away, not letting them uh, grow and, and, and become a source of further damage and, and disability. So two t I always tell my patient there are two main types of ulcers. Okay, There is the ischemic ulcers and the traumatic ulcers. So ischemic means is the results of a poor blood flow that gets to the fingers in the scleroderma patient. Usually the ischemic ulcers are on the fingertips, right? Either the fingertip or on the side, just the side. And um, more typical of patient with a limited form of scleroderma, certainly associated in, with smoking or other factor that, that gives a more uh, active vascular disease. And um, as opposed to the traumatic ulcers, as of trauma, which is present on the knuckles and cause ulcers and uh, um, they're not due to poor blood flow, even if poor blood flow can en en enhance them. The ischemic ulcers are deep, painful, because again, the blood flow, they can get easily infected and it takes a long time to heal. These are a few examples of, again, ischemic, ischemic ulcers. And then traumatic ulcers, again, other examples. As you see, exposed areas where easily the trauma can, can cause trouble. Right, how do we care for them? I want to understand one, uh, to explain one key principle. There is a vicious cycle that established when an ulcer forms. The background is there is Raynaud's poor blood flow, and oftentimes there is a minor trauma that triggers the ulcers. And this causes inflammation that together with the poor blood flow, easily they can cause dead tissue. That's how the ulcers manifest. So there is the poor blood flow and then something that causes local inflammation that increases the metabolic demand around there and, and therefore the, the nutrients are not enough and the, and the skin dies and you develop the, the dead tissue. And that tissue is good culture medium for bacteria. Actually the bacteria, when you have dead tissue, we need bacteria to, uh, to sort of process the dead tissue, but sometimes if the immune system is not able to get there and control, then there result in infection. And that's how the vicious, more inflammation, and then you spiral down. So the key thing here is really to try to break the vicious cycle when we try to deal with ulcers. How do, general principle, and I, I have five minutes so I need to go fast. General principle for, for, for management of ulcers. Number one, keep it clean. We already talked about keeping them clean and how, what kind of product to use. Number two, take your medication. And actually oftentimes when an ulcer manifests, we increase the, the vasodilated therapy, you know, the medication that we give to improve the blood flow. 
Surgery for, for, for ulcers, almost never indicated. It's very rare that there is only one little vessel that by passing it, you're gonna get better results. So surgery is rarely an option. Debridement, so which means removing the, the, the dead tissue, only if there is infection. We don't want to remove that kind of scab or escar, and uh, only if there is infection, then with a good hand surgeon, we can do the, the cleaning, the debridement. And why, don't, why do we wanna keep the dead tissue there? Because the uninfected scab, or, or escar, that's the name of it, basically create an, a, a protection for more bacteria to go in, minimize the, the fact that there is extension of the damage. So if you clean out everything, there is more tissue to die then. And then third, there are the nerve terminals exposed into the ulcers and, the, and that kind of scab protect them from being irritated. So in, improve the pain. So unless there is an infection, we try not to do the breedment. If there is an infection, as a general principle, you always treat it. You don't want an infection to go deeper. And pain, pain itself can cause narrowing of the blood vessel and poor blood flow. So we try to treat pain. It's one of the few cases where I do prescribe narcotics or we, there are these topical ointment that can numb up the finger. It can help healing during the acute phase. What kind of topical preparation do we use in ulcer? So the first three are antibiotic or uh, they fight bacteria. So the, the basic tracing and the Bactroban, the new piercing, are the ointment, antibiotic ointment that we choose and we prefer. I don't like neosporin, and that's the most common one. Everybody comes from neosporin or polysporin. Why? Because it contains sulfa, and, develop, and you can easily develop allergy uh, to sulfa based on those use, uh, pro protracted use of this medication, and, so, and it's less effective. So that if you need to get an antibiotic ointment, which can help preventing also further infection, these are the best ones. They're over the counter. You can find them. Sulf, uh, silver sulfadiazin, silverdein, is a preparation based on silver, which is good, it's bacteriostatic, stop the bacteria, but it cannot be used for a long time because uh, beyond stopping the bacteria, also stop the healing. So in, in the acute, uh, at the very beginning can be helpful, but not for a prolonged time. You can use hydrogels, basically these are polymer that keep water on a gel matrix, and they can coat the ulcers while allowing the ulcer to breathe. Um, there are some vitamin so like the A and D ointment, particularly recommended if patient is taking steroids. So the vitamin A counteract the effect of steroids that slow the wound healing. So that's a good, actually with good results. In some cases, we even give vitamin A by mouth, but that should be done by your doctor. The EMLA, so this is like lidocaine, uh, numbing medication. You can actually mix this anti ointment, antibiotic ointment with a numbing cream, 50%, 50% and apply it multiple times during the day. It does help if the pain is there and anything that works. What though is important is no peroxide, betadine, or alcohol. They, they, they damage the healing tissue. They make the ulcer worse. So I, I see patients that say, oh, I, I, I've been putting my finger into betadine, and I said, no, that's, that's, that's not good. It makes your ulcer worse. Devices, these are all or special dressing you can buy, they're expensive. The principle is to, to protect it while let the, the ulcer breathe, and. and Usually they are helpful if there is a larger ulcer. For fingertip, I don't think these are much helpful, but for example, if the ulcers are on, on the ankles or on bigger areas, those can be quite, quite on the elbows, for example. They can be very, very, very helpful there. They, they, they help a lot. Uh, you, same said for human skin allograph or artificial apigraph is a sort of an artificial skin. They can be very helpful to, to he help healing if the ulcer is not, not healing. And then we're gonna talk about the splints in a minute. So how do we treat the ulcer? If it is not infected, no or minimal cleaning the breedment, keep it clean, use the topical treatment that we discussed so far. If there is pain, you have to control the pain. If the ulcer is under the nail, sometimes we have to sort of trim the nail and actually cut, split the nail half to let the, the, the ulcer be outside. The under the nail ulcers tend not to heal. So sometimes it's a very simple procedure. They put a digital block, they numb up the finger and and then they, they, the nail will grow back, but that's the only way to make it heal. Vitamin A, if you are taking antibiotics, and, and, and if it is infected, you treat it. If the ulcer is infected, so redness, swelling, throbbing pain, drainage, then you need to do more. The breedman, so surgery, cleaning, cleaning can be indicated. Uh, if there is an abscess, you have to drain it. Uh, and um, you know, usually you have to put the, the hands in elevation 
protecting from, from trauma and uh, consider letting dry, the wound dry out. What's important to understand is if the ulcers is not healing with con constant drainage, we always are worried that the infection went too deep and now got onto the bone. Those are ulcers that do not heal. So we call it osteomyelitis. It's something that, to keep in the back of the mind if an ulcer for some reason, there's nothing that make it get better and the infection is always there. That's uh, demand further evaluation. Almost done. Uh, if the ulcer is on the knuckle, same principle I outlined for, for the fingertip ulcers. Plus, there are a few couple things to consider. One is, as we discussed extensively throughout the talk, protection from trauma. The second is to splint it <clears throat> because the movement of the finger may perpetuate the ulcer. So that's one of the cases where putting a little uh, splint temporarily until the ulcer heals is a good thing. You know, I showed you the, some, some splinting before. And again, this is another reason to consider the fusion surgery we discussed because that's the only way maybe to get the, he the, the ulcer to heal. Um, for the door, for, uh, on top of the sleeves that I showed you before, like, like this one, there is also the, the Mapilex is another one that you can sort of cut, cut and custom made and either directly on the, on, the, on, the, on the knuckles, on the exposed area, or even this is a patient of mine who created, he put it on, inside a splint. And as, as I said, sometimes to, if the ulcers is not healing, a little splinting with protection may, may help uh, management. So take home message, bottom line, and I'm done. So how do we manage the, the ulcers? Always take them seriously. You know, they can be much worse than you think. There is much more to the ulcer than just a little discomfort. So always take them seriously and, uh, and tackle them. Address them right away. Don't let them sit. Prevent infection. Be, you know, so you, daily cleaning, use of gloves, prevent them. It's much better to deal bef with prevention than with an established infected ulcer. Call your doctor, you know, show the pictures. And now there are all these, these kind of tools to send digital pictures. I do it all the time. Very helpful to me to, to understand what, what the patient is saying when the ulcer is not looking good. And, and the picture can help come on in or go to see your doctor and, and, and sometimes even deciding for treatment. And then seek expert care. If you get to do something, be sure that the hand surgeon is experienced because he can save your fingers. So um, I th hope that um, you know, we, I was able to provide you valuable information that in some way can, and some kind of suggestion and tricks that can help you to, to take care of your hands in a better way. And, but first and foremost, I hope that, that you agree that, that as every scleroderma patient is unique, so, so their hands are unique. And, and I think it's important to to keep that in mind when, when you see the patient for the first time and, and, and his or her hands. So this is a picture from the hill behind my new hospital. This is a, just a, a random bridge. I don't know. If, <laughs> <laughs> better than Baltimore, I can say. <laughs> and this is, uh, and this is my, my, my hospital. This is, was the hill where they took the picture. And uh, this is where I am now. Uh, Scleroderma Center with Dr. Anna Hamill is my, my colleague in, in, in two of us for the moment. And hopefully this will grow. Thank you so much for your attention.